Welcome to I Love to Tell a Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. I'm Catherine Schiffedecker. And I'm Christopher Fan Kaufman. This is the podcast for February 11th, 2024, and it deals with the transfiguration story uh, and then some. Uh, it starts in Mark 8, 27 with uh, Peter's declaration, uh, you are the Christ, and it goes all the way through uh, 9, 8, the uh, the the passion prediction, excuse me, the tra- the so-called transfiguration story, and includes the so-called passion prediction, which I will um, beat my hobby horse when we get to, to that word. Um, we skip ahead, we're, we skip some stories in there, which we pick up in other years of the narrative lectionary, but this is actually really a nice, pretty connection with the stories that have come before. Because uh, we got the story of the death of John the Baptist, and the name John the Baptist is going to come up in a couple ways in these two stories. Uh, the first way it comes uh, it comes up with is um, Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi. I want to talk about that in a minute. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they said, well, some say John the Baptist. They're like, Herod, remember? Mm -hmm. And others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets, especially these last two are the eschatological figures. Elijah, one of two figures in the Old Testament who doesn't die, but is taken directly into heaven. So then becomes, uh, by by the time of the first century, within first century Judaism, there's a lot of speculation. What's the end going to be? And that then there becomes this interpretation, especially going from Malachi, this uh, uh, or Malachi, depending on how you pronounce it, the last book of the order of the Old Testament that Christians use, where it says, I will send my servant Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And so he's expected to come back. Um, and so therefore, they're, they're, they're correctly seen that what's they're sensing that this is about this is about the great day of the Lord, that the 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 defining eschatological event is at hand. Uh, and then, of course, Peter says, you are the Christ uh, translated in my translation as you are the Messiah. Um, I have this question, though. Caesarea Philippi. Uh, Christopher, you are our uh, New Testament uh, 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 scholar, uh, but C- Catherine, you've probably been there. So the two of you, what do we need to know? What does that What does that location help us do with this story? Yeah, the first thing of this is just to look at the name of this place. So the villages of Caesarea Philippi, meaning they're in the vicinity of this city, Caesarea Philippi. And the first part, Caesarea, like Caesar salad, this has to do with the Roman emperor and... We're always very interested whenever we get. Uh, they are always subtle, these references to the Roman emperor. And here is one of them. So this is an imperial city. That is, is a city that the emperor Augustus is patron of. So his emblem is there. His, the worship on behalf of the emperor is conducted in this city. There is a temple to Zeus in Caesarea Philippi. And is that Pan? Is that the same thing as Zeus? Yeah. So what it is, is it's a temple. It is an old, as far as we understand it, an old Semitic temple that is then reinterpreted in a couple of different ways uh, through the god Pan, who is a god of Got it. nature and wildness and so forth. And then we get also the Zeus reference because Zeus is associated with goats. And mm-hmm. this there's a long story here in terms of how... Is that a very interesting story in terms of how these ancient religions made do with the fact that when the Romans came to town, things changed. And so they adopted and they massaged and so forth. And so there's a lot, there's a lot religious going on here, I think is the first thing to say when we see Caesarea Philippi. My my memory of visiting it, and I have been there a couple of times. It, there's a lot of water there, mm-hmm. uh, woods, caves, uh, a lot of uh, fresh water. It's actually a really beautiful site, and these remains of these, uh, you know, monuments or temples, uh, right to uh, to Pan to Zeus. Um, and I can't forget that Caesar claims to be a, a, a kind of god to a divinity. Mm-hmm. So to be in that place that has so many uh, 
you know, pagan and imperial uh, claims to divinity, right? And then for Jesus to say, who do people say that I am in that place, or in, at least in the vicinity of that place? Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, and then he gets the various answers. And Peter says, you are the Christos, right? You are the Messiah. You are the anointed one uh, that you know, the son of David, the one who's going to usher in the new age, the messianic age. Um, that's that's a pretty strong claim, right, mm-hmm. for a carpenter or or uh, whatever trade Jesus practiced, right, from, from little Nazareth in the Galilee. Um, that's a pretty strong claim to make, especially in the face of the imperial and, you know, uh, pagan powers, uh, that are commemorated or celebrated at Caesarea Philippi. The um, other thing just to mention is this is the first use of the word Christos in the gospel since verse one. Mm-hmm. Uh, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Mark 1 1. You don't get that ever again hmm. until now, hmm. so, which the 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 narrator has clearly held that back. Hmm. Uh, Jesus is referred to by the demons as son of God, and like the humans are wondering, is he is he John the Baptist? Is he Elijah? And now you get this, and then I I really think these center chapters eight nine eight nine and ten are central to uh, the Mark and narrative. It's where you get the three passion predictions, and because but I don't like the term. So the next verse, as soon as Peter says this. Um, Jesus orders them, don't tell anybody. And then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. And he said all this quite openly. So you get the great contrast, don't tell anybody, but now I'm telling this openly. And um, it's teaching is the verb. It's not predicting. He didn't uh, he's he's teaching them what it means uh, that he is the Messiah. And the expectations are very different than what humans, whether it's Caesar, uh, whether the, the Magi that we think of in Matthew or anybody would have expected. And that is a suffering, mm-hmm. uh, crucified Messiah. Um, and of course, now what that means, we can spend the rest of our lives talking about and Peter doesn't like it. Eh? I mean, as a prime example here, Peter, who has just said, you are the Messiah, the Christos, the anointed one. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. So, uh, you know, Peter's like the the best moment of Peter's discipleship thus far and then the very worst moment coming right after each other. Uh, and, and Jesus rebukes uh, Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Yeah, I mean, the human thing, uh, the, the idea of a suffering Messiah is not uh, not uh, something that uh, we want, uh, not something that human beings understand. It's a very paradoxical kind of divinity there. Yeah. And talking about paradoxes, and you know, one of the things we've talked about earlier in our podcast on Mark is thinking about the way that Mark uses irony. We talked about this with Herod and John the Baptist. And there's a little bit of irony going on here that we miss in our English translation because we use the term disciple for the uh, people who follow Jesus. And the term in Greek is mathetes, like mathematics. It means a learner or a student. Hmm. And so the irony here, of course, is that Jesus is teaching them and his students refuse to learn the lesson that he is trying to get across uh, because it is this very strange lesson. And to think about it in this particular way, it is not just the fact, I think, that of a suffering Messiah that is paradoxical, but that within, remember, we've talked about Jesus as somebody who is within first century Judaism, who is participating in these uh, discussions of what it means to be, have a Messiah, that the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, that is the people who should know what a Messiah looks like more than anybody else, are the ones who will reject him, kill him, and then after three days he will rise again. So there's there's a multiple ironies in here if you're looking at this from the standpoint of Peter, not just that the Messiah must suffer, but that as a Jew, to have 
these representatives of Jewish institutions openly reject the Messiah is also very troubling. Yeah. And the, I mean, I would add that the, the Romans also put him to death. So we, we had Amy Jill Levine on campus. So even as we emphasize um, Jesus' Jewishness here and the fact that his own people reject him, that is not then characteristic of all Jews. It's all humans. Mm-hmm. Um, and even those of his own religious tradition don't uh, were unable, as Paul that as Paul spells out in First Corinthians one through three. None of us could have seen this coming. No human being. Mm-hmm. I think that the the, the the yes uh, important point to make. Thank you, Ralph. The uh, the scandal continues, of course, right? Because uh, after uh, he rebukes Peter, Jesus calls the crowd with his disciples. And says, not only is he going to suffer, but they will too if they want to become his followers. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. Those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Um, so the uh, you know the the cost of following a suffering Messiah uh, is to suffer uh, yourself uh, to take up your own cross and follow uh, this one who goes to the cross uh, and to lose your life. But, and again, here's the paradox, right? In losing, uh, you find. Uh, in losing your life, you take up your life. You uh, you save uh, your life. Um, so, um, the, the paradox continues. And it's no wonder that the disciples don't understand what Jesus is talking about. I think no one no one would. Certainly I wouldn't have. But then uh, we should get to the transfiguration. Let me say one quick oh, thing yes, about go ahead. that. Verse mm-hmm. 34, let them deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. I was taught to regard this as an anachronistic uh, thing that it was Jesus' disciples after the resurrection who who used the language of take up the cross and follow me. Mm. If, though, we're supposed to take the narrative at face value, then before Jesus' resurrection, this is in some way a call to resist the divine claims of the emperor mm. to mm-hmm. divinity mm. and, and, to, and to pay the price for it. Yeah. All right, the Transfiguration. Yeah, so uh, six days later, so the little time passes there, Jesus uh, goes uh, to a high mountain, takes with him the, the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. Uh, and then uh, uh, he becomes dazzling white, uh, and, and Elijah and Moses appear. I want to go back to what you were talking about earlier, Ralph, with the... Um, expectation, the eschatological expectation, the expectation of the end times where Elijah will come right before the day of the Lord, uh, Malachi says that. But also uh, M- M- Moses as the preeminent prophet, right? Not often, or I always taught growing up that this was the law and the prophets, right? Moses representing the law, Elijah representing the prophets. Uh, but it's, it's more specific than that. Uh, Elijah as uh, this precursor to the Messiah, and Moses as the preeminent prophet, the the prophet who, uh, going from Deuteronomy, uh, when Moses says, God will send you a prophet like me, uh, uh, this again, is the prophet. Uh, uh, again, figure. another eschatological figure that uh, that will come before the end times. So, uh, so Peter, uh, of course, recognizes this right away. And wants to commemorate it to um, make three tabernacles, three tents, as in the wilderness, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Um, and what uh, what ends up happening is that doesn't that doesn't happen. Right? But a voice from heaven, uh, much like at Jesus's baptism, says, "This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him." So the the, the react the the response called for is not. Uh, to build tents or tabernacles, but to listen uh, to Jesus and to follow, uh, which is, of course, what Jesus has just said, right? Let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. And we see again, you pointed us to that first chapter of Mark at the beginning of talking about um, the use of the word Christ. And we get, again, very strong resonances with that first chapter, Mm -hmm. as you pointed out, the baptism language, but also Mark 
very clearly paints John the Baptist with the Elijah typology. Mm -hmm. And now here you have Elijah himself and the same sort of pronouncement. It's a repetition of that pronouncement that we saw back at the beginning of in Mark 1. And so there is a way in which we get Mark 1, and now here in Mark 8 we get that same message repeated, and then we will see in Mark 16 as well, Mark 15 and 16 as well, that same message brought a, th a third time in slightly different terms. Mm 